Funding for New Mexico in Focus is provided by viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, clouds on a sunny day. Reporter Justin Horwath tells us why a potential billion dollar deal with an international solar company could go cold. This is really where the rubber meets the road and if they can, it could be a huge political win for them, you know, 1800 jobs if they're created or it could kind of be a flop. And seeing red and blue, we parse through how the immigration and environmental platforms from both major parties would impact our state. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm senior producer Lou DeVizio. Tonight marks one century of Zozobra in Santa Fe as tens of thousands of people gather to watch old man gloom burn to the ground for the 100th time. Later in today's show, I speak with Ray Sandoval, Zozobra event chair for the Kiwanis Club of Santa Fe, about what's special during this year's milestone celebration. Later in today's show, a look ahead to election day, We'll hear from a journalist who is at the Republican and Democratic National Conventions this summer and a former state senator about the two major parties' platforms. We're going to zero in on two key issues, immigration and the environment. But first, we turn our attention to a major manufacturing proposal just outside of Albuquerque that's stuck in neutral. Local and state leaders have worked for years to turn a parcel of land in Mesa del Sol into the new home for a massive solar manufacturing plant. Investigative journalist Justin Horwath spent weeks untangling the state's business plans with Maxion Solar Technologies. That Singapore-based solar manufacturer promises to bring thousands of new jobs to Bernalillo County. New Mexico politicians have touted the deal as a job creator that could help break our state's addiction to fossil fuels. But as Justin reports in a recent story from New Mexico In-Depth, it's up in the air whether the project will become a reality. In an interview with executive producer Jeff Proctor, Justin describes the wrestling match between the United States and China over the control of the solar energy supply chain that's complicating the situation. Justin, welcome back to New Mexico in Focus. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, I would like to begin by talking about this image that people see on the screen right here. What is it and what does it represent? Um, that's going to be, uh, you know, hopefully for a lot of people, a... Um, a factory that produces uh, solar panels and solar cells, which are kind of the little semiconductor-like components that go on the solar panels. Um, and it, this is this is a proposal, a rendering by a company headquartered in Singapore named Maxian Solar Technologies, um, and they wanna they wanna produce solar panels in Albuquerque and have have an American-made products, American-made solar cells and panels to. Uh, kind of uh, be a part of the renewable energy economy that politicians are trying to attract here. Gotcha. Let's put it on the map for folks a little bit. That is in Mesa del Sol, right? In southern Bernalillo County. Yep. Yep. Just uh, southeast, southeast of Albuquerque. That's, um, that's a master planned uh, development that developers since 2005 have had this vision of a solar panel production factory being an anchor tenant there. And this is um, you know, after a couple fits and starts, this might come to uh, that vision might come to fruition with this this factory. People might remember company names like Shot Solar. I know there was another one. What was the other one? Advent Solar. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. That was the first uh, uh, corporate tenant that I think they recruited there back in the you know 2005 to 2010 era. Um, Advent Solar was a company that set up shop there, but they only lasted a couple years. What are we supposed to get if this happens? Um, I mean, New Mexicans will probably get, you know, uh, hopefully get uh, up to 1,800 jobs. You know, this the that's the number that they're citing. It de it's going to depend on production levels. Um, but yeah, I mean, jobs. That's I think that's what um, what the politicians here want. They want to they want to create jobs. They want to diversify our economy, um, and they also want to be a part of the renewable energy economy as we kind of transition away from fossil fuels. Okay, so based on the sketchy iPhone photograph that ran with your story at New Mexico in depth on this Maxion thing, that is not what that parcel of land looks like now. Why not? Correct. It's an empty lot right now. Um, and they, Maxion had said that they were going to start construction on the facility and break ground in the first quarter of this year. Um, you know, they're, they're, they've um, had some problems in getting it off the ground and getting this project started. Um, and now they say, that they're going to start construction in the fourth quarter. Okay. Um, let's get into some of those problems a little bit. And I want to start by reading a passage from your New Mexico in-depth story. I'm quoting now. 
a complicated web of factors outside New Mexico's control threatens the promise of Maxion adding 1,800 jobs outside the fossil fuel sector. One of those factors is China. What is China's place in the global solar supply chain, and how is that impacting this project? China is by far um, the dominant producer and exporter of key raw materials in the solar energy supply chain, um, polysilicon being um, the main one. And, you know, for years, China has has really built up this kind of manufacturing expertise uh, for solar energy. And nations around the world, uh, you know, Europe, Africa, the United States, um, Asia, we're all we're all depending on China to transition to renewable energy to a large extent because they just they they have the raw materials and we have um, if we want to make these transitions to renewable energy we're really dependent on them right now how has China's foothold impacted Maxion's bottom line Maxion is a company that operates globally it um, sells its solar panels, you know, in markets like Europe and Africa and Asia and everywhere. And so it's it's having to compete with uh, much cheaper Chinese solar panels. And so Maxion itself, it's it within the industry, it kind of has high end solar panels and a little bit of a price premium. So um, you know they're they're having to compete everywhere for these much cheaper Chinese um, solar modules, solar panels, and. Um, they're suffering as a result. It's really hard to compete with a country that has, um, you know, a, a relatively low wage labor force and also um, has built up manufacturing expertise. You know, if you're uh, manufacturing, you can, you know, over over decades, you can gain efficiencies that, you know, other, uh, you know, new startups are not going to realize for a while. So um, China is a big player here. What has the company done to address some of those huge balance sheet problems that China and other factors are causing? And how could those efforts impact this Maxion deal? Uh, one thing it did was turn to its largest shareholder, um, TCL Zhangguan Renewable Energy Technology Company, which is based in northern China. So this is a Chinese company that is now set to take over Maxion Solar Technologies as a primary shareholder. And so with that, it kind of complicates Maxian's bid for this factory right here because Maxian executives had said that they're um, kind of relying on this Department of Energy loan guarantee program um, to help finance this factory. Now, in order to get a loan guarantee from the Department of Energy, they're going to have to pass, you know, regular regulatory scrutiny in terms of, you know, this is a this is a Chinese company. China is our foreign adversary, and so DOE regulators are going to have to look at, um, you know, whether whether they want to finance uh, a, a company majority owned, uh, you know, by a Chinese a Chinese company. And so this is this has a lot to do with, you know, American and Chinese competition for, um, you know, who's gonna who's gonna control the solar energy supply chain and everything like that. And so, you know, there there are a lot of big factors at play here. One of those is the region um, in which Maxion is at least allegedly sourcing some of its supplies, the region in China. Mm -hmm. What's that about and what effect might that have on this deal? Yeah, so uh, Maxion um, and other solar energy companies have been, you know, in relying uh, on China for polysilicon. Um, they, you know, all, the region where the majority of the polysilicon is is mined and kind of produced in China is also um, a region where, you know, U.S. Secretary of State and the United States government alleges that China is uh, forcing the Uyghur population, which is kind of this Turkic Muslim minority population, that they're cons conscripting them to work in these in these mines, in these factories to produce polysilicon. So, you know, in 2022, Two, the U.S. passed the law banning all imports from that region, most imports. Um, because and, of the forced labor. Because of the forced labor issue. Yeah, we don't, yeah, as a, as a national policy, we don't want to be tied to this forced labor at all. But at the same time, you know, it's, 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 it's very hard to determine the sourcing of something like polysilicon. You know, we think sand and it goes into these ignots and they slice them into these wafers and that eventually makes a solar cell. So it's, you know, multi-step 
uh, process in the supply chain where it's very hard to detect where the polysilicon is coming from. And, you know, um, TCL is on Guan Renewable Energy Technology Company is owned by a larger Chinese conglomerate, um, TCL, which, um, you know, there have been some questions by researchers about whether these companies in China have ties to this, uh, this, this region in Qianjing. It's called the Qianjing Uyghur Autonomous Region, XUAR. And so, you know, they're going to, Maxian is going to have to find a way to prove to authorities that they don't, they're not sourcing their material from there. And they, they say right now that they're not, that they have, you know, suppliers in Germany and elsewhere, but it's, it's going to be an issue for them to, to keep proving to, you know, Homeland Security, Border Patrol and Production, uh, Department of Energy that they, that they're not sourcing their material from, from this region. Outside of some of these external factors, the company has had some other problems of its own, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's been having to deal with this this market where where uh, Chinese solar panels and modules are really dragging down um, the pricing of the solar panels. So it's it's going to force their competitors to you know drag down the prices, and that's going to really hit revenue. Um, and so they're dealing with that. And and you know they also they're a younger company. They spun off of an American company called SunPower, and they're I think that they're just trying to figure out how to um, operate in this environment and set up shop in the U S and so they've turned to, um, TCL, uh, for, um, about 200 billion, uh, you know, I think half of it was debt and half of it was equity, you know, meaning shares and stock. And so, um, they're really hoping that this capital infusion is going to help them build the factory. Um, but you know, that kind of remains to be seen. Let's swing the focus back home a little bit. Albuquerque Mayor Tim Keller, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham seem to have a fair bit riding on this deal, politically and otherwise. Mm -hmm. What have they done or offered Maxion in order to build that sucker? The state over over you know the years has kind of de developed uh, an incentive package for out-of-state companies that come in and they can take advantage of industrial revenue bonds, which are kind of complicated transactions that don't really involve taxpayer money, but allow the government to become the owner of this property, thereby, um, you know, reducing Maxion's property tax liabilities. So, you know, over a, th over a certain period, Maxion won't have to pay property taxes if they meet certain thresholds. Um, they're also getting local economic development act money and that's general fund money. That's everybody's money. And that's, that's coming from the state. So they get about 18 million from the state and two million from the city of Albuquerque. And in the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which is a federal law passed in 2022, really, I mean, it's one of the reasons they're locating here and solar energy manufacturers across the nation, uh, across the world are locating to America to take advantage of these federal incentives, which can include manufacturing tax credits, their customers get you know discounts for buying American-made solar panels. Um, and so they have, a really huge suite of incentives and Keller and Luan Grisham have really um, tied themselves to the Inflation Reduction Act and using that to uh, try to draw companies here and, you know, add their own state and local incentives. And so, yeah, I do think that there is a lot riding politically ad for, for Mayor Keller, for Governor Luhan Grisham, um, because, you know, re renewable energy and clean energy, that's that's a that's a really big part of their agenda. It's really. And, you know, this is really where the rubber meets the road. And if they can, it could be a huge political win for them, you know, 1800 jobs if they're created or it could kind of be a flop, you know. Incentives would be one word. Some of the people watching our conversation right now might also call those giveaways. <laughs> um, but I want to ask a really obvious question or at least what might seem like an obvious question. Why, in particular, for a state like New Mexico, is getting into the solar game so important? I mean, if you look at our economy and you look at um, how New Mexico depends on private industry, and right here, right now, it's fossil fuels, right? The the kind of we have a real fossil fuel economy. We're almost like a petro state where we're, we just depend on oil and gas revenue to fund a lot of our government programs here. I think it's maybe up to, what is it, a third of the budget is in some way kind of funded by by oil and gas. And, you know, I think it's always smart to diversify your economy and not just depend 
on one industry um, and an industry that sees a lot of ups and downs too. You know, it's not, it's it, oil and gas, fossil fuels. That's, that's not always a, a very stable sector. Um, so diversifying, I think is, you know, no matter what you're diversifying to, I think that's, that's a smart play right there. But um, I guess that's, you know, that remains to be seen. So your reporting has definitely shown that this is way more complicated than what we're reading in news releases from yeah. the governor and the mayor. What's next? What happens now? Um, I, in, we're talking right now. It's a Wednesday. And I believe on a Thursday um, tomorrow, there's going to be a shareholder meeting scheduled where there's probably going to be some news coming out about this facility, I imagine. And, you know, whether they're moving forward with the project or, you know, the construction start and everything like that. Um, and so, you know, I would I would just if, I would advise anybody who's interested, just kind of keep uh, keep up with Maxian on their website, their investor relations page. They should have updates there. Um, but yeah, I mean, beyond Maxian, I think that the state is also trying to recruit other companies too. I think that there was another proposal um, by a solar energy manufacturer that also wants to build in Mesa, Mesa del Sol. You know, 100 years later, I don't think that Schuster or any of his cohorts could have thought about how much time we spend on our devices and how much we are, we're alone, right? We spend so much time on our devices, we really don't see each other as a community anymore. And so to be able to come together and hang out with 60,000 of your closest friends and be able to burn away your gloom, right? So just to take that moment and just be in a community and to stop and think, hey, what am I doing to put gloom in my own life? What am I doing to put gloom out into the world? And can I stop that? Can I come back with a sense of renewal? We'll hear more about the 100th burning of Zozobra in about 30 minutes. Presidential campaign season is officially here. Both major parties have completed their conventions, and as New Mexicans consider who to vote for, we want to nail down exactly how our state and its residents fit into each party's platform. Over the next half hour, we'll touch on several issues with big implications for New Mexico, including immigration, environmental policy, and federal collaboration with tribal governments. Our guests this week are Democratic former state senator Dee Dee Feldman, who's been tuned in from here in New Mexico, and Sean Griswold, editor at Source New Mexico, who traveled to both conventions, first the RNC in Milwaukee, and just last week, the DNC in Chicago. Dee Dee Feldman, Sean Griswold, great to see you both again. Dee? Uh, now I wanna jump right into this with you, Sean. Uh, you were at both conventions in Milwaukee and Chicago. Before we get into the issues, what were some of your general impressions from both events? Yeah, from both events, I think what was immediately impressionable to me, and I have to break my objectivity as a journalist here for a second and just speak as a New Mexican. This state is great. I missed home so much. I missed everything about it. Uh, the pizza in both cities is pretty nice, but it doesn't have green chili. <laughs> Cheeseburgers are accessible, doesn't have green chili. But also there's just a diversity and a way of thinking and a thought process to who we are as people. And so in our coverage there was focused on specifically Native American issues. I was working with Native America Calling, as well as State's Newsroom and ICT, which is a national publication that covers Native issues. And that's what really centered me back to home. You know, I'm from here. This is my ancestral homeland. We're still here. And reminding people in Milwaukee and in Chicago from both sides of the political, of like the center of political power, who we are, what we are, what we represent um, was affirmed. And it really made me excited to be in New Mexico and just grew the love for the state way more. I'm so excited to be home. Yeah, I believe that. And that's nice to know. Um, now, Didi, Democrats were kind of in the doldrums over the summer. Uh, since Biden has stepped down, polling shows more excitement, more engagement, including here in New Mexico. What is it about the Harris Walls campaign that appeals to New Mexicans? Well, I think it's a big sigh of relief. Um, and, you know, this is a blue state. And Biden was ahead, but according to the latest Emerson poll, uh, Harris got a two-point bump or so. But that doesn't really, I think, show the uh, enthusiasm amongst the, the party workers and the people that attended the convention and the people that watched the convention. I mean, everyone is so excited um, to uh, get a Harris sign for their yard or to, I haven't seen anything like it, to, to figure out what to do. How can, how can you seize the moment? How can you um, really build on the momentum 
that Harris is showing at a national level. And of course, you know, there's a, a great deal of fear too uh, from uh, New Mexicans about what another Trump uh, uh, term would mean for New Mexico and the consequences there, as we know from the uh, 2025 report and from um, the statements about what would happen are, it's pretty dire. And so people are willing to really get out and fight now. And the fact that, you know, that the congressional candidates have gotten a bump from the convention and um, the and our Senate candidate has gotten a bump, I think that's really just made folks even more determined to help and to help people in other states as well, because there are a lot of Democrats in New Mexico who are writing postcards, who are making phone calls to help um, candidates, especially for Senate and for Congress in other states where um, it's a very close, close situation, especially in the House. Okay. Well, now getting to some, some specific issues here, I want to start with immigration. Um, the GOP, they have a hardline platform. That's not surprising to anyone, I don't think, at this point. Um, Sean, one of the shortest sections in the 92-page Democratic Party platform uh, concerns immigration and border security. Um, what policies would a Harris administration push for if elected, and why aren't there more details on such a complicated issue? Yeah, I think the details are going to be, well, we're going to understand this, number one. The change in the ticket does have to come from the fact that all of these policy positions are now coming from a new campaign. Well, Biden Harris are the administration. Harris is her own person. And I think that's part of the enthusiasm you even though saw in the campaign is you saw people take over campaign leadership roles. So everyone's trying to figure out where their position is. How are we going to be part of this not only potential administration, but also create the platform for everything? Sure. So I believe that timing is a big reason for it. But because of that, we still, because of the connection to the current administration, I believe we do still see a direct line to some of the asylum policies that have come under President Biden and also just directing to where the courts are. You know, there was a recent decision recently from a court that is um, um, blocking a waiver that GOP states were fighting on um, that would have provided people who are seeking asylum, their uh, loved one, like a wife or somebody like who they're married to, her husband, excuse me, um, to also come in and, and follow the same asylum process if they were still in another country. But that's being fought by GOP run mm -hmm. states. And so whomever is going to be the administration is likely going to see their immigration policies. And I think it's going to spread across whomever get contested by whether it's a Democrat in office, by Republicans in states like we're seeing currently, or if it's a Republican in office, by Democratic-run states. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, that seems to be kind of where everything is moving towards. Okay, uh, please. Well, well, the pl well, the platform is one thing, and it may be, I think it's just sort of follows in the tradition of Democratic and Republican platforms of being kind of vague on the issues. But I mean, Harris herself in her speech said that she would sign the bipartisan immigration bill that was passed by the Senate. So that bill uh, was, was pretty tough um, in terms of um, providing more funding for, um, for border protection personnel, more asylum officers, more judges, sure. and more money for services to of folks seeking asylum. So, you know, that's, that's, I'd pay more attention to that than I would the actual yeah. and, and, and I would say that's important to note, like it, that even just that legislation is looking to enhance and build out the infrastructure to make asylum processes work because it's not working right now. There's just not enough people to staff it. There's a backlog and, and that's why there's even more issues with asylum and why certain people even skip the process altogether. In order for Harris to even have that opportunity to sign that, the House, well, first off, the House is going to have to be flipped to a side that's going to be more friendly to that Reasonable. policy. Yeah. We're also going to have to see if the Senate's going to craft the exact duplicate of that bill. So there's a lot that has to play. And I think why we're here, even the platform as an issue, for right now, everyone's focused on electoral politics and winning an election to get to be able to make those choices in January. Okay. Uh, I want to stay on that bipartisan um immigration bill for just a second. There is some pushback from Democrats on that. Would you, how would you classify how the Democratic Party is positioning themselves from an electoral perspective, perhaps? Um, it, are they shifting a little bit to the right on immigration or trying to stay moderate to, to pull over some potential Trump yes, voters? Yes, I, I would say yes. I mean, first of all, you have uh, Biden's decision basically to close the border 
uh, in June. And that's something that the Trump administration did. Um, and he he did, too. It was it turned out to be a temporary. It's only it's capped, I think, at um, so many uh, so many entry attempts uh, per day. But um, I, you know, I think, you know, you got to realize that the platform is a platform, but individual candidates will have their own point of view. And so, um, you know, it might be a different if you're a candidate running in Arizona uh, or another border area, um, you might, and, a, and are a Democrat, you might have a different, uh, a little bit tougher um, stance than uh, some of the Democrats that uh, might have been on the platform committee. And uh, so I think, you know, I think that generally it's, a, it's, it's toughening because that's just political reality. That's what the polling data shows um, that, um, that Trump has succeeded in uh, sowing fear and misinformation about, you know, um, immigrants being criminals, for example. Um, and um, so that's, that's kind of the, the hand that the Democrats are dealt right now. And so they have to, you know, they have to do a little artful dancing on that. Yeah, it seems that way. Um, now, Didi, I want to stick with you for just a minute. In crafting this platform, and, and you mentioned this is a national platform that tries to find some middle ground so that every Democratic candidate has a legitimate chance to do well in their uh, particular state. So in New Mexico, what role generally in past elections, in past uh, conventions, do New Mexico delegates or state politicians play in helping craft a party platform? Well, um, at the national level, I think um, there is a platform committee and uh, there are um, uh, committee members amongst the delegates. And I think there are also some non-delegates that are part of that uh, part of that uh, drafting process. This year, I understand from the Democratic side, there was sort of a virtual call in where people could uh, give their their two cents as to what the platform should have. And then um, there was there were some hearings as well, um, so that's that's pretty typical. Um, the tricky part was that the change in candidates, the platform as drafted, was drafted before uh, before Harris was the candidate. But you know Harris is part of the uh, Biden administration, so there was a lot of uh, there is total carry through there too. The Republican platform process was a little different. I don't think there was going to be a, a Republican Party platform, but there and and instead there was this Project 2025, which is a, it, in a sense the de facto uh, Republican platform. Although there is a short document that was drafted at the last minute, I think without much public input, that pretty much mirrors the Project 2024 document. Um, so. Party platforms are one thing. Like I said, um, don't believe that every candidate reads the party platform and follows the party platform uh, to the, to every detail. Um, mm -hmm. They don't. Yeah, everyone's trying to win an election, so they'll. You know, we have to remember that all politicians will say whatever they have to say to win an election. Yes, but even when in office, they may not follow the party platform either. Sure. Uh, Sean, I know you were in Milwaukee also. Mm -hmm. That convention saw attendees carrying signs, calling for mass deportation, mm -hmm. chance of build the wall. I, I know we just talked about trying to play a middle ground here on an issue that really does stand out for a lot of moderates as there's some fear there, but why aren't Democrats making more of a stink about this issue? Well, since Obama, Democrats have been deporting people. So it's just now generational. That's it. That's, that's the U.S. policy. And we can say whomever it was, but this U.S., the U.S. government has systematically had a closed border policy on almost anybody who's not a United States citizen. And so, you know, in Milwaukee and understanding what the party platform is for that, I think it's very important to understand, yes, while the Heritage Foundation's Project 2025 isn't, is instrumental in a lot of what they did during the Trump's administration. And in fact, J.D. Vance, the vice presidential candidate, is a former uh, Heritage Foundation um, came from the Heritage Foundation after college. 
Um, Donald Trump still controls the party and the platform. And as he remains on the top of the ticket, he can change and do whatever he wants. Speaking to somebody who doesn't follow platform or order, um, and that was very clear. And I think that's why we still see the division. While the Heritage Foundation policies can be focused in on Project 2025, I don't even think they're fully convinced that Trump would follow through with what they want. Okay. Thank you both. We have to leave it there for now. Uh, but we aren't going anywhere. We are going to have to shift our focus a bit, this time to environmental policy. It was a big focus of Secretary of the Interior and former New Mexico Congresswoman Deb Holland's speech last week in Chicago. We're going to play you some of the introduction to that speech now, where Holland emphasized her indigenous identity and her home state of New Mexico. In my Karis language, greetings, friends, and family. My name is Kresh Turquoise, and I'm from the Turquoise clan. 35 generations ago, my ancestors built lives in the high desert of New Mexico. I am on this stage tonight because of them. While fishing with my dad and running through the desert with my cousins, I learned that we have a responsibility to take care of our planet. Now, Sean, you were in the convention hall when Secretary Holland took the podium. How was she received beyond what we saw in that video from New Mexico's delegates? And did others in the hall acknowledge or appreciate her introduction in Karis? Yeah, Secretary Holland, number one, yeah, the, the others in the hall did appreciate and understand it. Um, and I was sitting next to, um, I'm from Laguna Pueblo, like uh, Secretary Holland is as well. I was working with Sean Spruce, who's also a member of the Laguna Pueblo. And so when she did her introduction asking us how we're doing, um, my co-host, you know, responded as we're supposed, as we're taught to do when somebody asks how you're doing. And the response is, we're doing fine. Um, and from there, you know, the rest of it, I would, I did notice that uh, throughout the whole convention, you know, Secretary Holland was, was everywhere in the United Center where the convention took place, where the Chicago Bulls play. Um, and so she was well received and always had a crowd around her. A lot of people are still want to know what she's about, who she is. And then the many native people that were at the convention for the Democrats in Chicago all had an effort to try and go find her, take a photo, take a selfie. And she seemingly was always willing to take that on. And so pretty solid response, I would say, from what she represents, what she what she's trying to get folded into the Democratic Party. As we understand, the, the Native American vote in 2020 has been praised for giving a lot of slim victories um, in the, and even here in New Mexico in, in terms of down ticket, not just the presidential race like we saw in Arizona. So I think that that's also something to signify with the Democratic Party is the importance that, that they know the Native vote is to winning this election. Okay. Um, now, I want to stick with you for just a second. That, that growth and acknowledgement and appreciation, is there any connection between that and actual dialogue and collaboration with tribal nations and some of the concerns that those nations have? You know, there's uh, more than 500 tribes in this country and all of them have different priorities. In fact, there were several that had prioritized events at the Republican National Convention because the Republicans are speaking about energy exploration <laughs> as a form of sovereignty, as a form of economic development. And many tribal nations do have energy, oil and gas, coal, all kinds of energy portfolios in their investments. And so really it's about sovereignty for both nations. All tribal people want that. And where you're seeing more in the Democratic line comes from a, just a cultural practice of historically voting for Democrats, benefiting from services Democrats have, have championed and offered. But also from the viewpoint of Democrat outreach that is growing new leaders into delegate spaces, you know, people for the first time becoming members of the delegate, becoming members of their state party, and then growing from there as they saw someone like Deb Holland do in New Mexico to the main stage in Chicago. So nice. she represents a pathway for a lot of Native people that is like, oh, I can do that. Okay. Yes, and that pathway was through the Democratic Party because she was the head of the Democratic Party in New Mexico, ran for lieutenant governor, um, you know, paid her dues, essentially. And incidentally, didn't she look gorgeous? I thought she looked spectacular uh, on the podium there and I uh, was so proud to be uh, to be represented by her as well. Yeah, and, and that's a serious, you know, to, answer, to finish answering your question, that is where many want to take that, where that leadership group is, where they see, okay, I can do that. 
they're happy about the representation, but now representation is trying to get into the next stage of accountability and making sure that even those who are within those systems, mm -hmm. um, I remember we had a conversation who's a recorder in uh, uh, Pima County in Arizona, who's a, an indigenous woman who represents um, all people, not just native tribes in that area. And, and, and she says like she gets more votes from her own community than, than even Joe Biden did in the primary. So she's accountable at a different local level. And I think that's where a lot, I was, if, if you're gonna see a lot more indigenous people in local elected offices, they're gonna be more accountable to the people directly in their community. It's their cousins, their aunties, their mom, their dad. And, and that's something that is gonna to need to be seen at a national level. Understood. Um, now two areas where tribal nations have a vested interest, as you mentioned, are the environment and energy production. Um, take a listen to the difference in rhetoric on that issue from both conventions. I will end the devastating inflation crisis immediately, bring down interest rates, and lower the cost of energy. We will drill, baby, drill. In this election, many other fundamental freedoms are at stake. The freedom to breathe clean air and drink clean water and live free from the pollution that fuels the climate crisis. Now, Didi, no surprise in those competing visions, but Democratic's exact position is a little bit foggy. Other speakers at the DNC echoed Harris's comments about clean air and clean water. How serious do you think the party is about transitioning to renewable energy sources, energy sources in addition to cracking down on polluters, as Harris mentioned. Oh, I think the party is very serious, dead serious about that, and especially in New Mexico, where the New Mexico legislature has set a goal to, uh, in the Energy Transition Act, or the ETA, that you know there will be a hundred percent electricity will be a hundred percent provided by re renewables by 2050, and I think. To, uh, 50% by 2030. And what's happened in New Mexico, of course, is the uh, Inflation Reduction Act has, has provided so much money uh, to um, New Mexico projects um, uh, like uh, Maxion and, and others, um, and also tax incentives for rural electric um, co-ops and incentives for uh, people to put heat pumps in their homes and energy efficient appliance and uh, electronic vehicles. There's a real track record there that Harris uh, can claim of putting your money where your mouth is and really trying to stimulate an alternative to oil and gas and thus address the the climate uh, climate crisis, which the Republican Party. Uh, and particularly if you read the Project 2025, does not yet um, acknowledge as a problem. And that is really uh, saying something because that means that they're not trusting the science. And that's so in line with uh, a number of other uh, plans that uh, will you know, take a wrecking ball to the EPA, not trust the science when it comes to uh, PFAs and uh, those uh, toxic chemicals. So um, I think the Democratic Party at both the state level and the national level is dead serious and has focused investments in that area. Okay. Uh, Sean, this week, um, and Didi just mentioned Maxion, we spoke with reporter Justin Horwath mm -hmm. about the state's efforts to bring Maxion here to Mesa del Sol. Um, is it, what role do deals like that play in in here in New Mexico, uh, when creating and, and nationally also when creating platform policies on energy and on the environment. Yeah, I mean it's a continuation of political legacies, and I think that is one we can look that's directly tied to the Biden policies of just passing the Infrastructure Act and continuing the work from that. And I think that's something you would even consider if if Harris were to win again, the continuation of the policy set, you know, bringing it back to Holland and what the Interior Department has done when it comes to environment. Um, we've seen, you know, a direct decrease in coal production in this country, which is a position that Republicans are talking about wanting to go back to. Right. So it's really a reversal of all the different policies we've seen that would go back to Donald Trump 
or go back potentially in some ways to 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 Harris and, and even Obama, which started leading a lot of the coal reduction. Yeah. It wasn't lost on me, you know, watching from Chicago. So I was still out there, but the the San Juan uh, coal generating tower is going down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like that's the end of a legacy that Republicans are asking for. You know, that's something that Lauren Boebert told us when she told us on the radio at Native America Calling. She she would be the Interior Secretary if Donald Trump asked her to be, and spoke directly in opposition of the policies that would essentially just reverse the executive orders we have here and the executive actions, not just yes. orders, which is unfortunately, sadly, where our, our political system is at. Mm-hmm. Seeing the power that the executive has and how it's leveraged by both Democrats and Republicans and understanding that our electoral politics could just be a complete shift of all those policies, we seem to be losing the incremental progress we're making and taking many steps back. Yes, particularly if the if the uh, Republican administration does what it says it wants to do in the platform, and that is to uh, roll back the entire Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which is, is the biggest investment uh, to forestall climate change ever. And they would just simply like to, uh, to prevent those investments from coming to fruition. Um, and they would be able to do that if they controlled Congress, uh, but maybe even if they didn't control Congress because um, you know, with the Supreme Court's Chevron decision, um, which which will really sort of prevent the EPA and other agencies from issuing regulations uh, of any kind to support um, to support um, controls on methane, for example, or controls on um, toxic chemicals. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's very worrisome that all that progress could be undone. Yeah, and also the political reality of that situation, like, you know, Democrats and Republicans can say we want to do so much, but if a court order is going to block it, or the reality, especially when it comes to environmental regulations and protections for cleaner air and cleaner water, the reality of the U.S. system as it is may not promote that completely, and that could just be what, you know, is on the table for any administration. Okay. Um, I want to ask end with a question for each of you, and I'll start with you, Dee Dee. Um, are the National Democratic Party and the State Party here in New Mexico, are they on the same page? I, one particular issue that came up looking through the platform is this is the first time that in recent history, at least, that the death penalty or other issues have not been explicitly opposed by the Democratic Party. And I know I know that's something in New Mexico that we focused on in the past. Um, we talked about immigration. Uh, are, are they on the same page here? They're never on the same page, exactly. You know, it's just, um, it's just it, often, I think, in New Mexico, they're, well, we're an immigrant state, for example, so it's natural that we're going to be, um, you know, we're going to be more upset about the draconian uh, proposals uh, to end birthright citizenship, to deport millions, millions of people from the United States, New Mexico, has so many uh, families where um, at least one, uh, one parent was an immigrant. I mean, I think 10% now is the, is or 11% is the percentage here. And, um, you know, uh, those measures I strike at the heart of uh, uh, Hispanic Democrats in New Mexico often. And um, they're upset about that. And we have made progress in uh, alternative energy and other uh, in other in other fields, and so yeah, I think that the state Democrats are are more um, are more avid about those things. But that doesn't mean they won't support the national national ticket. Sure. How do you see the the split, if there is one, between the state and the National Democratic Party right now? Um, I mean, I think it is natural, right? Like, it's yeah. supposed to be combative. It's supposed to be critical. There's supposed to be some conflict so you can come to terms with whatever. But, I mean, it took everybody enough. Everybody got in line to get behind Harris before the convention even to calm the concerns of a split convention. And so I don't see the party backing away from voting for Harris or voting for any other Democrats on the ticket in fact, I think even before Biden was going to leave, there was going to be an uptick in advance because we've seen in so many local elections, Democrats and progressive Democrats reject MAGA policies, even centrist Democrats beating, yeah. you know, Republican extreme viewpoints. And so that seemingly was always on the move up. And I think that's where the excitement is coming from the Democrats is now the people who've been on the ground are like now the ones organizing, now the ones about to lead. And so for a state like New Mexico, the party has an opportunity because everything is moving west. Understood. 
Got to wrap it there. Democratic former state senator Dee Dee Feldman and Source New Mexico editor Sean Griswold. Thank you both. Great to see you again. I'm happy to be here. Every year, thousands of New Mexicans take the time to write down what's bothering them, sending their glooms to be burned in Zozobra. It's a 50-foot marionette meant to represent the troubles and hardships of the past year. Tonight marks the ceremony's 100th anniversary. This week, we spoke with event chair Ray Sandoval about the significance of Zozobra from New Mexicans and how this milestone event will be celebrated. Ray Sandoval, Zozobra event chair for the Kiwanis Club of Santa Fe. Thank you so much for joining me on New Mexico in Focus. Thank you so much for having us. We're really excited. Yeah. Now, Friday, it's the centennial celebration of Zozobra. Most New Mexicans know what it's about by now, but can you quickly explain what Zozobra is, what it represents for the city of Santa Fe and for New Mexicans on a larger scale? Yeah, absolutely. You know, Zozobra is our boogeyman. He is a specter of our own creation. You know, any time that we create gloom in our own lives or we put gloom or sadness into other people's lives, you know, there's an energy to that. And that energy accumulates and it manifests itself into this 50 foot uh, monster that uh, we have to get out of hiding and try to figure out how we're going to do him in. Very cool. Um, now, with it being such a significant milestone year, how have you and your organization approached planning this year's event? Well, you know, one of the things is the Kiwanis Club of Santa Fe, we're a service organization like Rotary or ALF. Our mission is to help young kids. Uh, we were given Zozobra in 1964 from its creator, Will Schuster. And, you know, we are the caretakers of Zozobra. But I will tell you that uh, both Santa Fe and New Mexico kind of has this love affair with this 50-foot monster. And we wanted to make the centennial really special. So we started planning 10 years ago, if you can believe it. Great. And two years ago, we invited a group of, of citizens to come and join us. We formed the Zozobra Centennial Committee. Um, we had 68 folks who stayed with us for two years in planning special projects and doing different things to really mark this as a milestone. And, you know, um, we brainstormed, we put a lot of ideas on the wall. We came up with 20 projects. And, you know, at the time, uh, someone leaned over to me and said, don't you think that's a little too overambitious? And I said, we'll be lucky if we get five or six of those done. And uh, we got all 20 across the finish line. So, you know, uh, New Mexico's determination, their love for our tradition and our love for our little boogeyman, I think is just inspiring. Yeah. Um, are those 20 secret programs or so, can you, so can you some share of them, a few of them? Yeah, absolutely. Some of them have already gone to fruition. Uh, we just dedicated a statue of the Zobra, a 21 foot statue outside the Santa Fe Convention Center. Um, we unveiled the 135 foot special shaped balloon uh, that the city of Santa Fe and the city of Albuquerque have helped. We will actually be inflating it Friday morning, starting about 7 a.m. Um, at Fort Marcy Park. Uh, obviously, it's not going to take off from there. We want to inflate it, show up, give everybody a little preview. It will be for the balloon fiesta. We hope we get good weather. Um, we have the Zobra painted, uh, little Zobra uh, painted statues. This is kind of a harken back, you know, if you saw the painted ponies a couple of years ago, or if you were in Chicago and saw painted cows, uh, we did these little four foot statues that, uh, you know, that kids could actually go up to, but they were, you know, unique pieces of art. So we're really excited about that. We partnered with um, Guye, who has made a sparkling wine uh, for Zozobra Centennial. We partnered with Santa Fe Brewing. Uh, they've made three different Zozobra beers, uh, an Old Man Bloom, a, a Fire Spirit, and a Tio Coco. And so that's just a, a small little sampling of the uh, different projects that we have for Zozobra's 100. Very cool. Um, now, I know a lot of people are going to be up there. Um, how many are you expecting? So we'll have a sellout crowd this year. Um, we're really close to, to selling out right now. That's about 65,000. You know, we want to make sure that um, a successful event to the Qantas Club is that everybody goes home safe, right? And so we have to consider that there could be weather, that we have to evacuate the field for, there could be somebody who tried to do something wrong. Obviously, we plan for those. We have tons of security. Um, you know, folks are going to go through at least three security screenings to get into the field. Um, and so the less that you bring with you, the better. Uh, but again, we want to make sure that people are safe. And so 65,000 is the, the max capacity for the event. Okay. Uh, now I know each year, old man gloom sports a new look, uh, what should we be looking out for this year? Yeah. You know, he's a hundred years old and so he is dressed to the nine. Uh, you know, he had on a beautiful, uh, 1920 tuxedo white with tails. Uh, he has a beautiful white silk vest that he's uh, sporting a beautiful black silk bow tie 
Um, I don't know who gave him one or where they found the rose, but he has a boutonniere um, and it's scaled up. So he'll be where he's flashing that boutonniere. He also will be wearing a diamond pinky ring for his 100th uh, anniversary. So uh, he's got a gold pocket watch uh, that's in his uh, best pocket. So, you know, I guess uh, he understands the importance of this anniversary as well and wanted to show up a dress for it. Good for him. Um, now, in addition to its message of renewal, this event is also unique in its focus on local art. Um, how are you involving local artists this year in particular? Yeah, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do is really make sure that every aspect of the Zobra could really bring in other New Mexicans and, and help us in our mission to, number one, help kids, but also through art. And so we had an art contest a little bit earlier. Uh, we had 600 entries. And I got to tell you, you know, trying to judge the Zobra in crayon is just really tough. And so I'm not going to judge anymore. I, I can't do it. They all just look amazing to me. Uh, but so we had a youth artist for the T-shirt, a youth artist for the poster artist. Um, uh, an adult art artist for the adult t-shirt and an adult artist for the poster part. And so that really gives us an opportunity to get those uh, people involved. The other thing that we do, though, is we want to make sure that we're looking at other artists. And so we have a national anthem contest in which um, we go out to talented City Mexicans and ask them if they would sing the national anthem. And uh, this year we had about 40 contestants who were able to choose uh, two, uh, an alternate and the person that will be performing the national anthem. And so we're really excited about that. And again, you know, if the Zobra can help in the arts, we want to really, uh, any way that we can, kind of push that ball forward. Yeah, very cool. Uh, I know accessibility is a big thing for Zobra as well. When Will Schuster founded the festival 100 years ago, his goal was to take Santa Fe's out outside, outside of galleries to community spaces, much like you are doing. Um, what efforts are being made to ensure that the 100th anniversary will be more accessible for New Mexicans? Yeah, you know, it's really important for us to do that. You know, obviously, we would love for the ticket price to be even lower. Um, the average ticket was about $35. We did have a New Mexico discount that you could uh, take $5 off of that discount. Kids 10 and under are always free. Um, you know, one of the things that continues to rise, you know, the Zobra has also had to deal with inflation. You know, we, we're dealing with inflation just in the terms of hourly uh, workers that we have to pay for security. Um, but also, we're seeing things that have gone up, you know, porta potties have gone up significantly, light towers, road closures, and those kind of things. And so unfortunately, um, you know, that uh, makes us really have to think about how, outside of the box on how we keep it affordable. So we are, you know, we're not happy that it's a $30 ticket. We still think that that's affordable, but we're really happy that we're able to keep the 10 and under free. Okay. Um, and is any of that money going to your organization? Yeah. So once, so, you know, ticket sales and merchandise sales um, actually are what pay for the Zobra. And then once we've paid all of the Zobra's bills, we then transfer any excess over to our foundation, Foundation of Olds and RFP, and then we help local community groups such as Girls Inc., Boys and Girls Club, uh, St. Elizabeth Shelter, Ski Adapted Kids, uh, Cooking with Kids. These are all nonprofits that serve our youth and our community. Okay. Now, 100 years for any event is impressive, and I know it's daunting to think about what this might have been like 100 years ago, but... And, and comparing that to what folks are experiencing now, but what does facing and overcoming old man gloom mean to New Mexicans in 2024 in particular? You know, one of the things I think is that we are resilient people, right? So you think about our native brothers and sisters who have been here and started cities. You think of the Spanish who, came, who traveled across an ocean. You think about those pioneers who moved from the East Coast to come here. We are a resilient people. And so there's not, you know, um, we all have our opinions. And there's lots of room for controversy, but there's not a lot of room for gloom in New Mexico. You know, we have sunshine a lot of the year. And so I think that it's really important for us to be able to come together as a community. And especially now, you know, 100 years later, I don't think that Schuster or any of his cohorts could have thought about how much time we spend on our devices and how much we are, we're alone, right? We spend so much time on our devices. We really don't see each other as a community anymore. And so to be able to come together and hang out with 60,000 of your closest friends and be able to burn away your gloom, right? So just to take that moment out of our, you know, 100, you know, uh, X, you know, tweets and, and looking at TikTok and so forth and just to be in a community and to stop and think, hey, what am I doing to put gloom in my own life? What am I doing to put gloom out into the world? And can I stop that? Can I come back with a sense of renewal? And so I know a lot of people think of the Zobra almost as their New Year's, right? I have people who make 
the Zobra resolutions instead of New Year's and tell me that they actually are more successful at keeping the Zobra resolution. And so um, this has become a really important cultural point in our in our state and in our city. And I think that that's why that there's this unique love affair for this boogeyman. Yeah, yeah, I can understand that. Now, each year, thousands of glooms are submitted to be burned. In your years leading Zozobra, do any glooms stand out for you? Yeah, you know, there's been um, some of the, that are just kind of strange. You know, we had a gentleman who brought a, what I thought was a brand new electric guitar and asked us to burn it. Um, we've had lots of wedding dresses. Uh, women who were surviving from who survived breast cancer uh, burnt bras in Zozobra. But I will tell you that one of the most moving things that was ever burnt in Zozobra was a couple of years ago, there was a woman um, and the security guard came over to me and said, would you go please talk to this woman? And as I approached her, I thought she was holding this blue blanket. And when I uh, talked to her, she was explaining to me that that was her hospital gown and that uh, a year earlier she had stage four cancer and that her doctor was trying to emphasize the point of how serious her condition was. And he pointed to her hospital gown and said, you know, you need to take this seriously. This is the last article of clothing you'll ever wear. And um, she said that it actually had the opposite effect on her, that she was going to survive and that she actually went into remission and she wanted to know whether or not I would put the hospital gown into the Zobra. And I remember looking up at her and saying no, and she looked at me kind of shocked. Um, and I said, you need to do this. And so we walked over to the Zobra together and she placed it inside the Zobra. I remember later that evening as I ignited our monster, um, I was standing back and I was watching it and I actually saw the hospital gown bird and it was, uh, it was definitely an emotional scene. I'm sure. I'm sure. That's really cool. Um, now, this year and in the past, I would imagine, have you submitted your own glooms? What's on your list this year? Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard because, you know, you're always thinking about what you could do and what you could submit and what you would write down and then all of a sudden the day comes. And so I'm glad that you gave me a reminder. I think I need to take this year, especially the, the, the magic of the 100th, and I need to write down my own gloom. Um, I haven't done that in, a, in quite a long time. I always intend to, and something always happens. But thanks. Um, I'm going I'm going to make sure that I do that. Absolutely. Ray Sandoval, thanks so much for joining me on New Mexico in Focus. Thank you so much. Appreciate it and love what you guys do. Thank you for always reporting on our culture and the beautiful things that happen in our state. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Funding for New Mexico in Focus is provided by viewers like you.